Hello and welcome to the video. This is uh, Prashant Talanayar Mutukrishnan. I am uh, recording this video just to be able to share my feelings, my experiences from this past week in the ICU at Albert Einstein College of Medicine Bronx as the ICU doctor uh, at North Central Bronx Hospital. And I pray to God uh, and thank him for giving me this opportunity to serve these patients uh, and be amongst our fellow brothers and sisters to make this experience um, something that we can handle as, as a team. So I'm going to uh, read out as I use these cheat sheets here. So in, I'm, I'm, I called it as the New York coronavirus epidemic in the Bronx offense and defense during the COVID World War III. So from March 16, 2020 onwards, our university affiliated hospital ICU 20 beds started getting COVID-19 patients with severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute kidney failure, and some of them with shock. By March 25th, all 20 beds had ventilated patients. About two to three we were able to manually prone every day. Um, sleeping on their tummy to help open up their lungs. We learned all these, all these techniques. Uh, for the first time in our hospital, we did this because there was uh, urgent need. And until then, there was always a sense of hesitation uh, about, about proning and we used to use beds, the rotating beds. But when the need came, the energy came from somewhere and we started you know, learning it ourselves from videos on YouTube and we just did it. And we, we are learning to still strategize the division of scarce labor, and we are trying to overcome the fear of getting infected ourselves, our civilian patients, nurses, physicians, administrators, housekeepers, assistants, everybody, they're all guards in human form. We are providing help for nurses and fellow colleagues with multiple unstable patient events happening simultaneously. And then our healthcare soldiers are stressed hungry and thirsty, then the experience of serving these patients becomes really painful and compromised. We, have, we were never trained to fight, fight a world war, although our ancestors did uh, you know, fight many wars before, uh, be it the Mahabharata war or the World War I, the World War II, or the previous epidemics or previous you know, economic depressions. So the civilians are our patients. They are fighting along with us, alongside our soldiers during the war. A good balance to offense and defense section of our army, you know, really helps us to, even if not win the war, but fight the war till the end. Nurses, doctors, assistant staff members are our soldiers. Virus particles, we think, are our opponents. The, and we need to balance being self-protective and and selfless as and I think that we are trying to find that balance between being self-productive and selfless while serving these patients uh, if really we want to fight till the end. Real-time experiences from the ICU battlefield, the teachings from various holy scriptures and world war strategies are further described in this article as I talk here. So getting the battlefield and the soldiers ready, various tools that I, as a pulmonary critical care physician, noticed in our hospital system um, to get our hospital ready included. Around February end, Department of Medicine email communications about online national seminars, webinar conferences, you know, about emergency preparedness for the epidemic. You know, started, I noticed that from February last week um, and hospital, although the first case of, uh, of coronavirus in the US came around uh, you know, the first week of January in Seattle, Washington. And that is where our, the problem of us being self-centered, saying we were distracted by the fact that, oh, this problem is in Washington, Seattle. New Yorkers, why do we care about it? There was that sense of confusion about what do we do about this? And so we looked for help from various organizations Hospital seminars within Department of Medicine about latest publications from China on co coronavirus, those were being used. And around March first week, 
Um, the first New York case got reported on March 2nd and system-wide email communications came alerting employees about emergency preparedness of ambulatory centers and urgent cares, you know, where should people go? Hospital administration discussed with departmental heads regarding the architecture of our hospital floors, ER, ICU, and potential patient flow, details of negative pressure room capabilities. Um, we had the ICU, we had PACU, a couple of rooms. We had um, you know, the general med surge floors with, with a few rooms. And all these matters were, and all matters were, uh, where there were directions from higher authorities and prior planning seemed to have helped in avoiding uncertainties and the stress of debates and arguments. Uh, infection control departments attempted to gather uh, recommendations from CDC and WHO regarding isolation precautions, hand hygiene awareness. So you see there has been so much of work that we have done during these, these weeks and it is for us to, to go on a positive note at the same time with caution so that we still continue to plan for these next few weeks of March, April, May, so that we get this under control, we are able to fight this war and, and also focus on the long-term pros and cons of the experience during this war. Because ultimately what remains will be our experiences, the mental connections, the feelings, the emotions that we get during the, this time the connections that we make, the people that we meet, and so on. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Departmental meetings about looking for extra physician coverage for the upcoming weeks was discussed, and then came March second week. Inputs regarding the importance of the flu season, how the flu is much more important than the coronavirus, that was also going on, and our assumption of which is important to focus on is also a possible distraction. And various organizations had an, influ uh, had an influence in the preparedness of our community. And, and the whole scene of the battlefield seems really magical, but horrific, and can be only attributed to the magnificence of this universe and its creator in the most gross and most subtle forms. Every act of this universe seems to be a miracle, and the power of thought is as powerful as the disease itself. And we have seen the extent of how fear and emotions can you know, influence the health of our, our human beings. Spectacular to see how the entire world is coming together as one in the name of coronavirus. So here I'm going to talk about some of the predicaments that we faced in, in, during this epidemic, right? And where we see the whole human race coming together. So in our hospitals, Uncertainties were there about the highest level of isolation precautions needed. You know, do we need contact plus droplet versus additional airborne uh, isolation and infection control department? You know, is gathering CDC and WHO data, spreading awareness of the best utilization of what you have, right? In, in war, you use what you have and we try to get what we need. And the need to readdress frequently during the epidemic. Questions about flow of patients into the ER and the wards into segregated sections where, uh, when coming in with respiratory symptoms, the hospital and the system chief medical officer disseminating system-wide information about allocating triaging manpower upfront at the entrance, closing all other entrances to the hospital. These were some of the amazing things that we noticed in our hospital and I'm sure other hospitals are working on it too. Diagnostic workflow for patients coming in with respiratory symptoms emphasizing on asking for travel history and sick contacts and how that changed over time where say, you know, irrespective of whether you traveled or not, you're in the community and now it's community spread. Testing actively for, for blow, both for flu as well as the respiratory viral panel, uh, looking for other viruses like adenovirus, et cetera. That was going on for some time. And then eventually we saw uh, that there is a specific pattern of these patients coming in with certain X-ray findings and severe hypoxia and so on. Um, and, and there is so much that we have learned during this epidemic that this seems to be such a new novel disease. Uh, and I'm, I'm totally uh, in awe of this disease. Testing actively for both flu as well as respiratory well panel and empirically putting patients in airborne isolation immediately on arrival to the triage nurse in the ER. 
patients with hypoxia that respond to low flow nasal uh, oxygen, regular nasal cannula, how the ICU attending was notified by the ER and accordingly informing him so that you know they know that there is a potential case you know going to the floor and potentially can get worse so that we keep track of what to expect up in the ICU. We also you know looked at the, the limited availability of negative pressure rooms in the hospital wards and ICU approximate counts um, of about six to seven in the ICU and uh, about about you know four in each of the floors in the meds med surge floors. We had a total of 20 ICU beds, 40 med surge beds, two packy closed rooms with other open pods, and ER also had a few rooms that were closed with the other areas that had just curtains. And this is where we strength strengthened the defense strategies of our staff by ensuring um, and 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 you know talking to them again and again about please wear your masks, please adequate N95 mask usage. Um, uh, there is no hurries in trying to get to these patients if you are not going to you know, make your defense stronger. Um, additional face mask. So this, these were the things that we used. Um, it was you know, the N95 mask and on top of that, a face mask with, uh, with an eye shield is, some, is something that we used and a contact gown. Um, at least in the ICU when we enter the patient rooms, goggles, even if you're wearing a, you know, in a, your own glasses, try to see if we can wear additional goggles and, and something like a shower cap and shoe boots uh, and, and uh, boot covers or shoe covers. And we try to encourage patient, uh, the families to uh, you know, uh, try to you know, keep in touch with us over phone uh, rather than visiting us. And those were some of the amazing steps that we had taken much ahead of time. Um, some staff were inconsistent with the use, you know, use of all of these um, about personal protective equipment PPEs, and each one of us kept reminding about others to maximize PPE usage. And I'll tell you why. Specific transport precautions were used when suspects and COVID-positive patients were taken for testing to the radiology suit, you know, from the ER on their way to ICU. We tried to plan things in such a way that there is no unnecessary tr uh, transportation of these patients. Um, oh. This one is good. Uh, scarcity of dialysis capable rooms in the ICU. Our first COVID case was admitted to the ICU on March 17th. By, by 25th, our ICU was overflowing with all COVID patients except for three non-COVID patients. And by then, it was day seven or eight of ICU stay for some of those initial patients. And they started needing dialysis. And we did not expect so many patients needing dialysis all at once, right? Because we could take care of these patients when they all came once in a while but all of them together it was was a real challenge. And so um, the number of patients that we felt needed dialysis for the, for the best outcomes uh, kept multiplying. And we had two dialysis technicians, one was working day shift and the other one was working evening shift. And so, and some COVID patients were moved from their original rooms to other rooms where hemodialysis was possible. And at one point of time, we were like, can we keep one room or in a few rooms open so that we can actually just move these patients across the hallway of the ICU to the dialysis room and then can we get them back to their rooms? That was one of the thought processes. And so these, uh, these debates and, and conversations that we had, I thank our, our Department of Medicine chair, woman, um, our boss uh, in the ICU, um, and, and, and many others, uh, you know, each and every one in our ICU and uh, hospital administration has been so, so helpful in trying to make this experience, um, you know, repeatable or, or easy for us. Because ultimately, it's all about how we go through this experience. Because we are really not able to find out whether one is right or wrong, right? It's all about how, how the experience is going to be. This disease is such a novel disease and we are still learning about this disease. And I know that it's not fair for our patients. It's not fair for our fa or the families of these patients. It's, um, what we are going through, we cannot use that as an excuse to say that this is why we were not able to save these patients. But this is our, our sincere uh, uh, request to all the families um, of patients to 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 uh, you know kindly understand uh, the, the the difficulties all of us are facing together.
and they have been they have been amazing the families have been amazing amazingly understanding on the phone as we try to keep in touch with them every day and we have had social workers who have been trying to help us you know in calling these patients families um because uh, even our residents are you know very busy and we uh, have been doing a wonderful job um with the families uh, covid patients took more time and manpower compared to non covid patients that was insane during the peak of march 23 to 31 when um i was in the icu in fact uh, again that's where you know we come to understand our real feelings some of us during the march 1st or 2nd week went oh, oh god i don't know whether i'm going to be in the icu rotation during that time or not uh, when is it going to peak and all those feelings um uh, uh kept uh running through our minds and and so happened that uh so i was there uh in the uh, in the icu during march 23 to 30 to 29 but thankfully to my boss and my other colleagues they all joined me because i was supposed to be the only person there but everybody came we just took it over as a team and i i totally thank our, our team for that and i'm sure that's happening all over the 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 world the entire human race coming together this is this is what we are seeing so covid patients took more time and manpower compared to non covid patients we had um, as of march 23 to 31 we had we could not take care of we felt that we could not take care of the three non covid patients that were left from the you know previous week you know a couple of them had uh, copd and uh, some pneumonia and uh, so we had to track them we had to put a tracheostomy so that we could get them out uh, of the of the icu and we did not know where to send them um because you know we didn't know whether long term acute care facilities would take these patients or not so that is something that we also went through and we, our social workers helped immensely our surgeons helped so much by performing the tracheostomy within no time uh, for our patients for those two patients and we had another person with seizures who uh, came from outside hospital and and in a, uh, and uh, we had to keep him on cruise control with a lot of sedation trying to keep him out of seizure while we you know try to focus our uh, time on all these crashing patients uh, from covid so quality of care versus quantity of care that is an excellent uh, topic uh, we can never uh, you know come to a conclusion here because again there is no right or wrong thing we have to basically decide on what we get to choose at this time and try to give it a balance for example accepting patients from that are being transferred from other hospitals because you may have heard from doctor uh, from andrew como our governor uh, saying how the the hospital systems try to you know you know um, distribute patients between themselves Uh, and within the system first and then our other systems so uh, amongst the all the hcc facilities we started getting patients from all over the city uh from bronx queens brooklyn and so on and and so we had other discussions brief discussions and all and and thankfully uh, our uh, chairman uh, chairwoman um administrators had already planned this and and just directed us uh clearly so that we didn't lose time on on the thought process so that we as physicians were able to purely execute what we are good at doing and so yes so we accepted patients um uh, as they came in because some of them were in the ERs in other hospitals uh where there was uh, but they had no not too many nurses to take care of and you know rather than having some EPE patients crashing patients in the ER or other parts of the hospital um you know it is better to accept them and keep in keep them in our icu um even if it's overflowing and try to see if we can you know get more manpower and try to uh, balance that uh, so that was something unreal because uh, as against we could just say no we want to just focus on the patients that we already have uh, and try to see if we can save them um and i think as we go on during these next few weeks i would i would encourage all of uh, the hospitals to to plan and 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 have a uh, have a discussion about this much ahead of time 
uh, use of ultrasound imaging in guiding COVID patients, the, the fear, right? There is fear. That fear factor is crazy. Um, you know, should we even go and take this ultrasound machine into the room? How much time are we going to spend, um, you know, uh, standing next to this patient? Um, and is it going to be uh, worthwhile uh, trying to get a sense of, um, uh, you know, what these patients are? So there was, there was no time, you know, to, to spend on one patient for even 10 minutes or 15 minutes, because by, the, by then there would be another patient on the opposite side of the hallway that's, uh, that's crashing and they're calling me outside. So those were really uh, testing times and, 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 and we, were, uh, we were guided very well by our, by our um, colleagues in saying that, you know, don't worry, you take care of this, let me go and take care of the other patient and I'll come back and let you know what, you know, so division of labor. And we've done this many times in war times and it was unreal to experience it in real life. The, one of the most important things that we tried to focus on was the number of times that a healthcare worker entered a patient room. At least um, you know, a couple of times every hour, I made sure I, I spoke with all the nurses saying, hey, are you going into the room anytime soon? Um, please tell me so that we can plan things together so that the number of times you get exposed to this patient is as low as possible in a way that we can still help these patients. Although we had the best of the available PPEs, still we had no clue of how powerful this virus transmission uh, uh, to the nurses and the physicians. Because we wanted to be alive, we wanted to be healthy so that we could come back every day and serve these patients. Portable radiology imaging, yeah. Uh, you know, we, uh, we tried to be as conservative Caution aggression is the term I use, but giving it a balance to the amount of aggression and conservativeness uh, while trying to repeat imaging uh, during our daily rounds. Because every time a radiologist went, he had to lift the patient back and you know put the radiology film behind the patient and to take the portable x-rays. So there were so many such um, examples where we found that you know, there is, um, there's a lot to think about. Uh, what to do and what not to do. Scarcity of physician manpower for multiple events happening at the same time, right? I cannot believe how thankful I am to the surgeons, uh, uh, the surgeon team, uh, the other physicians from the internal medicine, our residents stood up um, for the situation, the anesthesiologists, um, they, were, they gave it a beautiful balance between defense and offense being defensive, protecting uh, at the same time, making sure that they do their best for these patients. Um, residents and interns trying to understand their role in such busy times, you know, should I put an order? Should I get blood work? If the phlebotomist is not able to do things, should I call families? And, 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 and I'm thankful for all these different groups of physicians and, and uh, nursing staff. Important question that came up, was how intense should the nursing uh, staff be doing their charting and documentation? Um, because you know, you know, during war times, there will be compromise to certain things if we want to achieve certain other things. And I'm happy to, uh, that the you know the administration um, and even the physicians were, were as um, conservative as possible when it came to requesting uh, nurses to ch you know chart and document certain things, for example, the I's and O's, the intakes and outputs, et cetera. And, and, uh, I, and I know I saw multiple times physicians requesting saying, hey nurse, instead of you going there, I'm anyways going in there right now because I need to so and so. Do you have any medication to give? And you know, the, so, the, so we started learning how to use the IV tubings, uh, the IV pumps um, and so on so that we were able to adjust the dosage of the sedation, we were able to push meds um, as needed if we wanted to uh, you know, help out the nurses decrease the number of times that they're entering. So, uh, and I don't think we would do this on a normal day, right? And that's where this, uh, this war has, has really brought us together. That sense of, of compassion 
not just for the patients, but for our own colleagues has come up. And, and I, I cannot thank enough my colleagues uh, for doing, uh, for just being you know, what they were. We had more uh, issues going on. Dialysis catheters were not functioning well. Uh, some of our patients were, uh, were either obese, um, the thickness of the soft tissue was, was, uh, was good enough to, to make the dialysis catheters uh, collapse during such negative pressures. We were not able to understand why. Sometimes it was positional and there was no time to lose. Um, um, and, um, and if the dialysis technician was available only for two or three patients per day, any delays in such, uh, such care made the next patient not be able to get their dialysis. And, and so there was testing times and I'm um, thankful for the surgeons again who came and helped us with you know, repositioning catheters, et cetera. Um, and I remember two of these patients came out from, with center lines uh, from outside hospitals and they were about three, three days old and we wanted to, they were having fevers and we wanted to be uh, sure whether, you know, is there bloodstream infections because of these catheters? So we had we requested the surgeons to um, to remove the you know catheters and put new ones in. But then three days later, these patients went into renal failure. And now they needed dialysis catheters. So so there were so many so many you know, such situations uh, that were coming in. So they we, then we started planning. Okay, maybe from now, if you need a central line or if you need a dialysis catheter for a patient who you think you're already starting to see some worsening of creatinine, then why don't you just go ahead and put in the, the trialysis catheters, which is they have two, two ports for the dialysis and then there's a third central line port. So that was useful. And, and we didn't have uh, enough staffing, at least during the peak two to three days uh, for CVVH, continuous venovenous hemofiltration, uh, because that would take up uh, a nurse by itself, uh, and uh, and we had about uh, one pa one nurse for three patients, um, and I think later uh, I think later that week we had one nurse for four four patients. Um, <clears throat> so the and then we started you know our nursing administration started you know recruiting uh, nurses from all over the country, and it was amazing to see buses buses coming in outside uh, the hospital campus where nurses were were walking into our. Uh, building with new kinds of scrubs, and I knew they were from different states and uh, and, and uh, cities. So, central lines, as I told you that, and I already talked to you about how we try to address telephone communications with families. I myself um, remember speaking with a few of the uh, patient families uh, before um, they. Uh, before they got intubated, after they got intubated on, put on the ventilators. And sometimes I remember just having such conversations with patient, uh, uh, patients, daughters, sons, about, you know, giving them the news of uh, how they were doing. Some of them died and it was a, it was a heavy, it was a heavy experience. And I have made it a point to vent out my feelings. I cried out many of these days and those really helped. Um, and and you know, this, reading the scriptures, listening to audios uh, of, of people like Joyce Mayer and so on have really helped a lot. And, I, and we have the H3 uh, helping healers heal the psychological support in our own hospital. That was one of the most amazing things that, that we had where you know, we had our our uh, social workers and um, and psychotherapists come and spend time with our our staff. Um, so those were some of the the workflow related uh, predicaments that we faced and how we dealt with it. Um, next is some of the clinical parameters uh, and inconsistencies in this unique disease. Number one. Um, our assumption that the respiratory failure and the renal failure may be similar to more common etiologies such as flu, such as uh, regular bacterial pneumonia, or other, you know, other etiologies for ARDS. We assumed that, and we were totally wrong, I think. Um, 
it, and this was being tested, right? The hypoxia in these patients were anecdotally not accompanied by severe hemodynamic compromise, um, uh, sometimes the need for intubation um, and the initiation of mechanical ventilation was very difficult to decide because there also were uh, you know, questions about, oh, should we go straight to intubation or high flow nasal cannula, you know, initial, uh, uh, just one or two studies came out from China uh, where they were concerned about uh, the aer aerosolization. And then now, you know, there's always that conflict of interest from you know, different organizations. So it is really hard to decide. For example, some of the high flow oxygen companies have come up with saying, yes, there is aer aerosolization, but no difference between any kind of um, respiratory therapy that you provide. And so that made it very difficult for us, but at least we decided as a team uh, to proceed as fast as possible from high flow, uh, from non-rebreather mask or anti-mask directly to intubation. Um, the renal failure behaved in such a way that the creatinine tripled and quadrupled in patients with, within 72 hours and the debate between fluids for the kidneys versus caution to the lungs gave us testing times. We always kept uh, you know, in mind, hemodynamics, lungs, and then kidneys. But then, you know, these patients were on pressors, and these patients had beelines all over, and they were, some of them were, you know, breathing very heavy. Only a few were sedated very heavily, uh, and so, in, and so there was active breathing. So you really cannot test your IVC ultrasound techniques. So it was really hard to understand their volume status, and that too, there is no time. Right, so these are the problems that we had, and therefore that's where we had our ICU boss. Um, and she was very, 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 very helpful in in uh, in recommending to us, saying, "Please take small steps at a time. Caution the aggression. Right, you cannot you cannot change things overnight or over an hour. Just small, one you know, step at a time and see what happens. Be cautious, be receptive to you know, what happens. Um, and we tried our best. And we are trying to improve on these things. Um, and, uh, um, you know, most of the, our patients, I will be, you know, doing a, a chart review very shortly. We are looking at, uh, you know, eyes and nose intakes and output, net negative balance, where we able to achieve net negative balance for these patients. Who are these patients who died? Maybe we should have given them more fluid because they died of hemodynamic compromise. Those are questions. Um, and tidal CO2. Um, and, and, and before I, I go there, we seem to take things personal and that's affecting our ability to function as a doctor. For example, there are certain therapies that we are giving. There are certain moves that we make, offense moves that we make uh, you know, as we try to get these patients better and something happens, good or bad, and we immediately try to associate um, the outcomes with what we try to do. And then that affects our emotional stability. And, and, and that... And, and this happened re in real time. And this was, this took at least a few hours uh, of our time to just recover from a bad move or a, or a good move um, for us to get back to reality and move on to the next one. So one thing that I learned from these troubled times is that to see if maximum possible, if we can not take things personal, um, you are not the doer, um, the disease process is happening and you are a bystander, you're trying to be supportive care because some of these patients just crashed and we are, we are really understand, trying to understand why did that happen uh, so that we don't repeat that for another patient. And each of these patients is so unique that it was really hard to replicate certain things in on other patients. Use of paralytics, use of, um, use of uh, Lasix, use of diuretics, the dosage and et cetera. So, uh, end tidal CO2 monitors were used sometimes. That's the next point. But did they really help? It helps to get a sense of where, where the lower limit of arterial carbon dioxide levels could be. But we know that arterial PCO2 levels in patients with lung injury may be much higher compared to the end tidal CO2 due to uh, inability of the alveoli to empty carbon dioxide into the tidal breaths. So we have to 
unfortunately or fortunately we had to enter patient uh, rooms for arterial blood gas measurements multiple times and and the entitled co2 levels only helped sometimes um, so that's one thing that i would like you to uh, i would like to caution you guys about in these next few weeks a few of the things um, that i wanted to mention were you know, a few of the patients were edematous the longer that they stayed and we know this uh, the longer you stay in the ICU, you are likely to get more fluids either in the form of sedatives or other medications or tube feeds or your third spacing. Phlebotomists could not draw morning labs uh, because they were, you know, patients were swollen. The night shifts were busy and the residents could not successfully get samples consistently. Um, such delays in blood work were also accompanied by inabilities to decide plans early in the morning during rounds with the nurses. Our hope was to keep nurses you know, from entering their room to less than three times a shift or two times a shift. And I'm afraid we were not able to do that. And that's where the protective equipment comes in. And uh, so even if our defense moves, uh, even if we're, our offense moves were, uh, were not at the best, in those situations, we tried to make the defense stronger and vice versa. If the defense was not strong, then we tried to see if we can back off the offense, right? Um, many patients were on propofol, fentanyl, or propofol versed in our hospital. Um, and we were hearing about shortages coming up. Uh, so elderly patients became constipated with fentanyl. This led to difficulties with potassium clearance because we were trying to use caxalate and other things like lactulose for renal failure to try to see if they can move their bowels. Um, so that we could delay dialysis, right? Um, com compliance of the chest wall and lungs was also a concern for us due to constipation. And I noticed um, that some of these patients, although their creatinine was going up, their metabolic acidosis was actually not that bad, but their pH was bad. Uh, of course, they had respiratory acidosis um, and, and they were not really volume overloaded in the first five days and we were really wondering, should we dialyze them right now? Or should we just keep going on diuretics and try to get them net negative? How fast do we need to get these patients net negative um, was again a concern. And th that sense of desperation to achieve the outcomes really drove us crazy. And, and again, came uh, to our rescue was our seniors. Uh, the senior physicians really said, again, please focus only one thing at a time. Just take it one hour at a time. For now, what are you giving? And see what happens in these next few hours. See if the urine output improves. And, and that's where we started looking for resources from China, Italy, and seeing, you know, what are these, what are the characteristics of the lung mechanics of these patients? Are they really B lines because of volume overload? Is this, is this PEEP really going to help them? And so on. So in so coming back to the fentanyl story, so compliance of the chest wall and the lungs was also a concern because of you know uh, constipation. Some of their bellies were huge, um, and they hadn't moved their bubbles for like three four days. And we tried many different things, um, and in such patients using versed internal fentanyl in the second half of their course, we tried that. But then by the time the patient got sicker due to other reasons, and then they passed. So it was really hard to get a sense of um, a feedback from these patients on what we are doing and what could we do better in future patients. So are there potential areas to address? I have a lot to say, but this is some of the things that I thought I could share. Um, you know, I know that there is f uh, antigenic drifts and shifts for, for flu virus, so I'm assuming that there is possibly antigenic drifts and shifts for the coronavirus, also likely, um, and this may uh, you know, potentially happen in, you know, during other seasons in uh, other upcoming years. And I think um, as a person who believes in uh, nutrition and um, in integrative medicine, uh, along with critical care medicine, I think the onus is on each of us in this human race to work on strengthening our immunity by gut healthy practices and community welfare measures. Um, spreading the awareness about uh, how we need to focus on our health, not on our professional achievements. At any point of time, our health comes before professional achievements. Um, taking frequent breaks, um, 
uh, at workplace or even if you are at home trying to uh, eat the best of the foods and this uh, epidemic has forced us to stay in our homes and now i am assuming that so many of us have started cooking uh, like we never used to cook before uh, and so this is where we need to start looking for resources about what are all the gut healthy life practices and i will share it in in other videos that uh, i'll be passing on in environmental factors and you've already seen videos about how the smog levels in different cities uh, are way different we've always talked about climate climate control and we wonder whether this um, this is a manifestation this this pandemic is a uh, is an expression of mother nature on how she wants to control control her own uh, backyard so again i think that if we want to uh, take some message out of this pandemic it would be uh, number one that during times of troubles that we have to um, keep the higher power um, in our minds and and hold on to him tight and and ask him to help us go through these troubled times and to uh, and to help us uh, serve these patients the role of the nutrition support uh, ways to monitor and improve staff nutrition during high volume disasters such as these uh, is so important i saw so many of my nurses and other residents and sometimes i caught myself you know not being able to eat until 2 pm or 3 pm um, and and uh, you know it it, it caused a sense of uh, of hangriness uh, we were hungry we were angry Uh, but still we kept our cool because we all we had in mind was i want to serve these patients and that's where we have to balance the defense and the offense because if we are not healthy then our defense mechanism goes down we become sick and the number of you see i hear the ambulance um, outside the window and i think that the number of ambulance coming around this area is way lower today compared to before um, so so yeah coming back to um, supporting the nutrition of our of our our healthcare staff is so important because we cannot afford to lose our defense um, otherwise we will lose more manpower and it will be harder for the remaining soldiers to keep fighting this war by themselves right so we have to balance the defense and the offense moves that we take um, so ultimately the mental health is so important for our healthcare workers because we are going through such hard situations and we need love and we are seeing love from all around us and thanks to our doctors physicians administrators our families back at home um you know lots of phone calls from families asking us to take care of ourselves and and we have um you know our own spouses um you know ready back at home to try to serve us food and also i will end this video with one last uh, thing saying that right now i'm i'm on my day off and and right here i'm thinking what do i do should i take rest should i call them and see if i can help uh you know help anybody on the phone remotely do i try to see if i can publish something uh in this one day and uh, can i try to you know look up my patients can i record this video as i speak there are so many thoughts going on in my mind what can i do um, and ultimately i say that whatever you do i'm trying to have the, the common motto in our, in in, our, in my mind which is whatever we do we are not the doer that the higher power is the doer and we are enacting this drama um, and and all we can do is stay balanced stay detached to the outcomes of the the entire drama and keep him uh, and his holy name in in our minds as we go through this thank you and uh, i will be very happy to uh, do more of such talks and see if you would like to invite uh, me for such talks during my free time i'll be happy to share some of our our uh, events that happening in our hospital at North Central Bronx Hospital here in Bronx New York stay safe guys thank you